Howdy! This is a continuation of the original screencast that I did on AngularJS titled Intro to AngularJS. Uh, so if you haven't taken a chance to watch that, uh, you should definitely do that. I'm going to link it in the video description below. Uh, so a, a lot of the feedback that I had from my original screencast was, uh, you know, it's good to look at the AngularJS fundamentals, but many developers were wondering how do, how do we sort of integrate this in a full end-to-end -end scenario with uh, an app that we might be working on. And so I took uh, a bunch of that feedback into consideration when developing these materials. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is the, the link, uh, github.com slash davemo slash end to end with AngularJS. So you can go and download the code. Uh, so if you want to follow along and look at all the pieces that we're going to be building, you can go ahead and clone that repo as you're watching this uh, and kind of see uh, the end product of what we're going to build. Um, just to go over what we're going to cover, uh, we're going to look at um, Angular's HTTP abstraction, uh, which is kind of analogous to jQuery.ajax. Uh, we'll look at that authentication service we built earlier in the Intro to AngularJS screencast, and we'll actually make it work end-to-end -end, uh, against a, a MySQL database. Um, we're going to look at creating a Flash service. So if you're used to using a server-side MVC framework like Rails, uh, there's something called the Flash where you can display messages to users uh, on different request redirects. We're going to look at creating something like that um, purely in Angular. Uh, we're also going to look at um, this idea of access control and how we can control um, resources or access to client-side routes uh, using root scope and route provider. We'll look at routes that might load a page that depends on some API data uh, and how Angular makes it really easy to uh, add that dependency at the route provider using the resolve property so that your uh, views don't render prior to the data finishing loading. We'll look at HTTP provider and response interceptors and the ability to uh, add some logic so that we can automatically log users out if uh, the server side returns something like a HTTP 401 if their server side session is expired. And we're going to do this all in the context of uh, a PHP app framework called Laravel. And I'll just pull it up here. And Laravel, um, if you haven't heard of it, it's similar to many of the other server-side MVC frameworks like Rails, uh, like Django. Um, and I hadn't actually used it before, and I was trying to decide what uh, server-side language to do this screencast in. And I've worked in Rails and Django and a bunch of other frameworks, but PHP seems to sort of hit the sweet spot in terms of uh, ubiquity on the web. So uh, you should definitely check out Laravel, and I'll also provide some links to um, other resources if you want to go and learn more about Laravel. We're going to move pretty fast through this stuff uh, because there's quite a lot that I'd like to get through. Um, but if you check out the, the repo for this screencast, you'll see that there's a bunch of requirements and PHP 5.4 is one of them as well as the mcrypt library. We're also going to be using MySQL but you can use SQLite uh, for this screencast and we're going to use AngularJS 1.1.4 which is the latest sort of bleeding edge um, uh, unstable channel. There's a bunch of installation instructions for PHP 5.4 and Encrypt uh, and Composer, which is kind of like a, the package manager for PHP. I'm not going to walk through them here. I'm um, just going to assume that you have that stuff installed. What I am going to show you here is uh, the version of Laravel that we're using uh, is sort of the edge version. It's version 4. If you go to 4.laravel.com, You'll see there's a bunch of instructions there. It gives you uh, steps to install Composer and Laravel and then some configuration information. Basically, just run through installing Composer and Laravel. And once you do that, uh, you'll get a directory that looks kind of like this. Um, and if you've used other server-side MVC frameworks before, uh, this will probably look familiar. You've got uh, a vendor directory, which uh, Composer will pull all of its um, dependencies into. If you're used to Node and NPM, uh, Composer uses a JSON file called composer.json, so you can see all the dependencies here of Laravel. Uh, this stuff is just all generated for you when you install Laravel and clone the, the sample project directory. But uh, let's start out looking in the app directory first. Uh, you can see that like other MVC frameworks, we've got um, models, and Laravel gives us a couple of pieces to start with uh, out of the box, the, a basic user model. Um, Laravel uses something called Eloquent for its ORM which stands for Object Relational Mapper. Uh, and basically that, if you haven't used an ORM before, it's just a way that you can query your domain objects like users and things uh, with a pretty nice interface without having to write SQL. Uh, not that you shouldn't learn how to write SQL, but uh, 
Um, so you can see that this uh, users model, uh, there's a table called users that it maps to, and we've got a password. The other thing I've done uh, in this project is set up some migrations. And you can see that there's a couple in here. And the first one uh, that Laravel actually gives you is uh, the ability to create a users table. So let's start up by opening up SQL Pro. And the first thing we're going to need to do is connect to our local MySQL instance and create a database. So let's add a database called Laravel App. Uh, this is all in the instructions um, in, the, in the readme for the repo. And let's take a look in our uh, terminal session here. Uh, the other nice thing that um, Laravel gives us is the ability to have this artisan command. Um, and if you used uh, rake, uh, which is the uh, Ruby um, sort of task runner that comes uh, that's used with Rails, it's very similar. Uh, you get a number of similar sort of targets that you can access at the command line. Uh, the one that we're going to start with is uh, migrate, which is going to run those migrations that I've got here to create our users table and a sessions table. We're going to store uh, the session data for our users that are connected to this web app in uh, the database. So let's go ahead and do that. So you run PHP artisan and say migrate. And that will migrate things. And now if I go back to SQL Pro and refresh, you'll see that I've got a bunch of stuff here. So I've got um, the migrations table, which is what Laravel uses internally to keep track of uh, what migrations you've actually run. So you can see that both of those have been run and they, they ran in the same batch. Uh, and now I've got the sessions table and a users table. And my user, the fields that are in my users table basically map to uh, the fields that are in that user um, model, if we open that up again. Right. So that gets us up and running with a schema. The other nice thing that Laravel gives us is the ability to run uh, a local development server. Uh, so if we do php artisan serve, um, you'll see that it starts up on so that's pretty cool. Let's see what we get out of that. We get a nice big error message. And the reason we get this, uh, and this is actually one of the nicer features about Laravel 4, is the error pages are pretty descriptive. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm missing a piece, so let's go back and see what I forgot to add here. Right. Uh, I think I need to run the seeds so that I can have a user. This is another feature of Laravel. So if you check out the app database um, seeds, uh, you actually get a, a default database seeder file. And when you uh, generate a project in Laravel, this will be um, commented out by default. So we'll just uncomment that. Uh, it's going to call the users table seeder. And we can take a look in there. And it's actually going to jam in a sample user, which is what we're going to use for uh, to authenticate against our AngularJS app that's going to sit on top of this. So let's go back to the terminal and run php artisan uh, db seed and then if we go back to here and refresh the content you'll see that now i have admin at example.org as my user my password is nicely encrypted using the mcrypt library that's uh, one of the dependencies for laravel and we've got our timestamps for created at and updated at all right let's run the server again and reload and I think I'm probably missing uh, the root level controller. Um, so if you're familiar with other uh, MVC frameworks like Rails, uh, there's a routes file that kind of controls everything. And so the first thing that we want to do is we want to add a route to serve up the, um, the content from the first tutorial, which is basically the static markup for the index HTML page and uh, the app.js file and those CSS files. So let's do that. So the, the way you do that is by interacting with the route command in Laravel. And if you've used Sinatra or uh, Rails, it's basically similar. One nice feature uh, that I didn't actually know was in PHP is uh, closures. And this looks awfully familiar to JavaScript. Um, but uh, it's cool. You can have anonymous functions that just do things. And uh, in Laravel, uh, all of the classes that you're going to interact with are pretty self-explanatory. So I've got a route, and I'm mapping the HTTP get verb to slash, and I'm going to say that I'm going to make a view, and I want to render something called single page. And let's take a look at where that goes, which is kind of as you would think inside of the views folder. 
and I've got this single page HTML file. And I've basically taken the assets from the first tutorial uh, and stuck them inside of the public folder. So if you take a look here, I've got Angular, I've got our app.js as it existed at the end of uh, the intro screencast. Uh, I've added underscore. I think there was one, there's one piece that we're going to use uh, for that, so that's why I added underscore. Uh, and then here's our two templates, that home.html and that login.html. So now that we've got our route, let's see if uh, Laravel is happy. Oh, I couldn't find it. I wonder if I need to name it .php. Let's see. Even though there's no dynamic content, I may need to do that. Now let's reload. There we go. All right. And if we take a look, uh, we're getting a 500, and that's because uh, if I go to app.js, uh, in the intro tutorial, our templates were just in the root directory, and now we've actually subdirected them under uh, templates. So let's go and fix that. Yay, now things should be working, and this app I think if you remember from the first tutorial, uh, the authentication service was just this trivial algorithm where our uh, username was Ralph and our password was Vigum, and that uh, that was what redirected us. So let's see if that's all still working. I think I might be typing it wrong. Ah, I know what I did. Uh, I actually changed um, our login form as the first step to use uh, credentials.email instead of credentials.username. Uh, and the reason for this is if you look in the database, uh, the thing that we're identifying a user by in our simple app is uh, admin at example.org, which is an email address. So let's start. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is this authentication service doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, in the context of our app where we actually want to authenticate against uh, a database. So we're going to take it and make it actually work uh, so that it queries the back end. So let's do that first. The first thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to inject HTTP. Uh, HTTP, as I mentioned earlier, is Angular's way of interacting with um, the various HTTP verbs, post, get, delete, put, and I believe patch support is in the latest release. So if you remember, we've got our authentication service, which has this pretty simple interface of a login function and a logout function. And that isn't going to change a whole lot, but instead of this silliness where we're just checking against the local scope variable, we're actually going to get rid of that. So let's whack that. And we're going to use HTTP to access some things. So we want to post our um, credentials to the URL auth login. So let's pass our credentials. And we're just going to return that from the, uh, from the login and logout. And we'll talk a little bit more about the internal interface that HTTP uh, exposes uh, in a little bit. And let's do logout while we're here. And we're going to say we're going to do a get to auth logout. So if we reload our page, and we actually try and use admin at example dot org and the password it's generating is admin uh, if you remember from our uh, database cedar and or is it user cedar you can see that the um, you can actually use this hash class in uh, inside of Laravel to hash out whatever the password is and that'll store uh, things cryptographically for you so let's do that and hit login. And what happens? We got a 500 because we haven't actually configured that route in Laravel. And you can see here's the response. What do we get? Nothing super helpful. Not found HTTP exception, basically because we haven't added the route. And so let's go back to our routes file and let's do that. Let's, uh, we had route get auth login. And instead of a closure this time, I'm just going to do the logout one as, as well. Uh, there's a, a syntax where you can pass the name of a controller. So in this case, we're going to create, create a controller called auth controller. 
uh, we're going to call the login method. And similarly for logout, we're going to call the auth controller uh, and logout. So you can hook up uh, routes in Laravel with uh, closures where you just have an anonymous function, or you can pass uh, controller um, strings separated by an at where you're defining the specific method. There's also another way that you can hook it up using uh, Laravel's resource mapper, uh, kind of the, re the more restful way, um, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of, of this video. So let's go ahead and look at that controller, and again, this is probably familiar if you've used other MVC frameworks, it's going to be inside of app controllers, and we've got our auth controller. And there's nothing inside of it right now. Uh, we basically need to add the code that's going to do our stuff here. So uh, let's do class, auth controller, and every, every controller in Laravel uh, extends from base controller. And we'll do that. And let's create our functions. So they're going to be public, function login, and we'll add logout as well. And the way that you interact with authentication in Laravel um, was actually, I had, was doing research for this and uh, you know I was had come from using things like devise in Rails and they were sort of complicated to hook up. And uh, when I was researching what framework I was gonna use, I was actually pleasantly surprised that the only thing you have to do uh, is um, use this auth object and it just kind of works. Uh, so we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna attempt to log in and the values that we want, um, we wanna use an associative array, a PHP associative array. We wanna grab that email. And again, another nice thing about Laravel controllers is you can grab any of that input from input. Uh, and because we're gonna be sending a JSON payload with those credentials, we wanna say input JSON, uh, we wanna grab the email, and then we want to grab the password similarly from input JSON password. And we have all these extra brackets. I'm just going to shrink that. Okay. And the thing that we want to return uh, is a response object. We want to return it as JSON. And we want to grab the current user as JSON and return it. And if they're not, if that login attempt doesn't work, uh, we're gonna return another response object again as JSON because we've got our single page app. And we're gonna do um, just a simple message for now uh, using something called Flash, which we're gonna build a little bit later. Um, we're gonna say invalid username or password, and we'll send a 500. And let's add the logout function as well. Really simple uh, auth log out and we'll return another response as JSON with an associative array with that flash message that we're going to build a little bit later and we'll say log out. If you used Rails or uh, if you've used Laravel before you'll know that there's actually an internal flash um, that you can use and that's sort of more uh, appropriate if you're building a traditional web app where you've got a full page reload request response cycle and that's basically how those flash tools are built. So the flash uh, message that we're going to implement is actually going to be uh, client-side only um, using Angular. So let's see if we've done things correctly now that we have our auth controller and it extends the base controller. Uh, we've wired up those routes so that when a get comes into auth login, actually I think that needs to be a post. Let me just check. Yeah, because we're posting that form data. Uh, let's see, yep, we're doing HTTP post. And so now, if we reload and try admin at example.org with a bad password, we should get a 500, and the message that comes back should be, there we go, invalid username or password. Uh, so if we do the actual password, let's say admin, uh, and now, there, we got the JSON of the user object. So now we're actually authenticating against our uh, database. Um, we don't have a way to display error messages yet. We're going to look at that in a little bit. Uh, but this is basically sort of all you'd need to do to get up and running end to end, at least with Laravel. And one of the things that surprised me about it was how fast it was uh, able to get up and running with this.
So one of the discussion points that this leads to is maybe it's not appropriate for your app to do uh, you know, full-blown single page. And one of the other strategies you could employ uh, is to sort of split your app where you have a hybrid single page and traditional web app. And what that might look like is having your login page just be the only thing that's accessible outside of uh, being authenticated. And then you use a traditional form submit. You use you know, Rails or Laravel's uh, form helpers to build a little uh, form that can log you in. And then once you're authenticated, you just redirect them to your single page app. Uh, I didn't choose to do that because I figured people would want to see how you could authenticate against uh, the app uh, without having to do that hybrid approach. But it's definitely something to keep in mind. And if you've already built uh, authentication pages with uh, Laravel or Rails or any other MVC framework on the server side, then you're probably pretty uh, well versed in how to do that. So let's see, we built our authentication. Uh, we talked about hybrid approaches to auth. And it works, but our app isn't really too smart yet. Uh, so what do we want to do? We want to add some of that other logic that we had back in place where we redirected. Uh, so let's go back to our auth control, our authentication service rather. And we want to hook into uh, the return value of this so that we can do something with it. And I think the place that we want to do that is actually in the login controller. So. Uh, we can do that here. Uh, the interesting thing is because HTTP.post returns uh, a promise object, we can hook into its success and uh, error methods. So when we're in our login service, we can say authentication service.login with those credentials, and we can attach a success callback. And it's just going to look like this. And because we were injecting that location, uh, service from the previous uh, tutorial, we can do the same thing. So I'm going to say that once we authenticate, we're going to redirect to home. So let's reload. And admin. And there we go. And if I filter these just to XHR, you can see that there's our post. Uh, you can see what we sent. Uh, the request payload is JSON. And we got back JSON as a response with the user information. And our uh, app still kind of works. And if we hit log out, Nothing happens because I don't think I've actually wired that up in the home controller. I have, oh, there we go, logout. So similarly in the home controller, if that logout call is successful, now we want to uh, redirect back to the login page. So let's do that. Uh, we'll inject our location service. And we'll set the path back to the login. So now if I reload, I'm on the home page, and I hit log out, there we get back to uh, this page. So that, you know, that's the basic sort of auth flow, but our app is still pretty dumb. Uh, you know, we don't have any um, logic in place to say that uh, we're going to restrict the contents of these routes based on the fact that you're authenticated. And if you're using that hybrid approach, uh, you know, that, that might be a little bit easier. But because we're not doing the hybrid approach, we're probably going to want to add some smarts to uh, add some um, restrictions in the router. And the way that we do that is by configuring the route provider uh, with a little bit more logic than what we have right now. So let's do that. So we've got this config block uh, up top here, and we've configured uh, the app and the route provider to sort of set up our routing. Um, the way that we uh, add additional logic is in this run block. And so we're going to inject a couple of things in here. Um, the first one is the root scope. And if you remember from the previous video, or you've watched John Lindquist's Egghead I.O. videos, you'll know that the root scope is sort of this gigantic scope that uh, every controller inherits from. It's sort of the place that you can put cross-cutting concerns. And given that uh, access control to our router, or our route provider, rather, is cross-cutting, that's where we're going to stick this. We're going to add our location. Um, we're also going to add our authentication service because our authentication service is going to be used to determine whether the user's logged in. Uh, it's one of the pieces for that access control. So the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at the concept of uh, event broadcasts. 
Um, if you're familiar with backbone.events or even plugins like jQuery PubSub, uh, you can use uh, similar methods on the root scope or any scope, um, dollar on uh, to listen to events. And the event that we're going to listen to uh, is built into Angular. It's called route change start. And this is fired uh, as soon as the user hits a fragment in the URL, um, but before the route has actually the route change has actually taken place. And there's some hard-coded arguments that you're going to get with this. Uh, the event, next, and current. And so the reason we're listening to route change start is because we are going to uh, check to make sure, this is where we're going to build our access control uh, to make sure that the user is logged in. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have some uh, routes that require auth. And right now the only route that requires auth is home. So we're going to stick that in there. And then we're just going to check and see if uh, routes that require uh, if that contains uh, the value of the location path as they're trying to access this. Um, and uh, they're not logged in, which we haven't built yet, but we're going to do that. Uh, so in that case, we want to just redirect them back to login. Uh, and that's all we're going to do for right now. Um, and we haven't built this authentication service is logged in. So that sort of brings up the discussion of another point, which is uh, session management. We've got our sessions being managed in the database. You can see that uh, right here. Uh, here's my active session. Uh, and whatever the session timeout is, it will be configured inside of Laravel. But uh, that sort of model of session management works for uh, traditional server-side web application. And we want to have our client-side application sort of be the single source of truth and, and, and sort of directing things. I mean, it's going to receive information from the server, but we want to add a little bit more uh, smarts to it so that we can uh, do things like this access control on the client side. So let's go ahead and add our uh, isLoggedIn method. And that will just appear down here. Just another function. And this is going to bring up, uh, you know, I kind of hinted at session management that we're going to have to do. So uh, let's add a session service. And we're just going to say that the session service, whatever it is, it's going to have some key to indicate that the user is authenticated. And we're just going to call it authenticated. So let's inject it here. And we haven't created it, so we can do that again. And the session service, uh, it's just going to be a really simple interface. Uh, so we'll make another factory, we'll call it the session service. Doesn't even need anything uh, injected into it. And here's our interface for session service. Uh, we're going to have a get function with a key, uh, which will return some value. We're going to have a set function with a key and a value to store some value. And then we're going to have an unset function so that we can uh, remove something from the session storage. And the the thing that we're going to use, I mean, you could use cookies to do this. Uh, there's a couple other things you could use local storage, which I've used in the past. But HTML5 has session storage built in. Uh, and I'm not adding any kind of robust checking, any feature detection. You could do something like that with a library like Modernizer. Uh, I'm just assuming that uh, you're going to be writing this in a modern browser that has session storage. But uh, you know, to make this a little bit more robust, you would definitely want to add um, something that detects if, uh, if it has Sessions, if the browser if that's running this app has session storage um, uh, oops, and uh, polyfill appropriately. But in this case, I'm not going to do that just because we're pressed for time constraints. So we've got our get, we've our set, uh, and those are both going to call get item and set item in our session storage. And unset is going to remove an item. And so now that we've injected our session service in here, uh, we can get authenticated. But we need to modify our authentication service so that it actually caches that stuff uh, in the session service. So let's go back to authentication service. Where are you? There you are. And we're going to add a couple of functions here. So we want to cache the session. Uh, we want to uncache the session. And we want to, uh, oh, that one's not cool. We built a flash. And so when we cache the session, uh, we're going to access that session service, uh, and we're just going to set authenticated to true. And when we uncache, you can probably guess, we're going to call it unset. Authenticated is just going just to remove it. 
And again, uh, you know, I talked about the fact that uh, Angular's HTTP dollar HTTP implements uh, promise interface. So one of the nice things uh, about promises is that they're composable, so you can assign them to the return value. So when we log in, uh, I'm going to say that uh, this is login, and when we're successful with that login, we can cache the session. And similarly with logout, I'm going to say logout. We want to uncache the session. And those two things, uh, in conjunction with our routes that require auth, are checked to make sure that the route um, doesn't contain that route uh, and they're not logged in, uh, should allow us to have a basic form of access control for our routes. So let's reload the page and let's try to go to home. And you can see that I got redirected back to login. Why did I get redirected back to login? Because uh, that routes that require auth contains slash home, which was the value of the location path that I typed into the browser, uh, and my authentication service uh, is logged in returned false. And let's just explore kind of what that looks like. If you're in Chrome DevTools, you can take a look at resources, you can go to session storage, and you can see that there is nothing in session storage. Uh, and because we added that behavior, if I go and actually log in, now you can see that I got a session storage value set. And it looks like I got a syntax error somewhere. Oh, right. Uh, so when I eliminated the return value and sort of started composing callbacks onto the promises from HTTP, I forgot that I also need to return those values so that uh, further up the chain, I can still attach callbacks to that. Uh, so if we go back here and we go to home. I'm not logged in, and you can see in resources, session storage, authenticated true. Well, that doesn't look right. It should have let me go there. Uh, let's restart because I think there was a callback that was missing. So I cleared out my session storage, example.org, and then did I get an error? Hmm. So it's at this point where I would probably stick a debugger in. So let's check a debugger in uh, here. And reload. And so we can take a look at and interrogate this stuff. Uh, so we can see that routes that require auth contains that. We can see the location path is login. Uh, so it's just going to let me through, and then if I go to home, I hit my debugger again. Let's see, authentication service dot is logged in. Null. Well, that's no good. So I think I have a bug in my authentication service is logged in. I, yes, I have a spelling mistake. One reason why strings and variables should probably be short, uh, or you should use a spell checker to maybe check for spelling mistakes. Uh, so now, if I get rid of that debugger, I got rid of it. Let's just reload. Uh, make sure my session storage value is not um, set. One of the interesting things about session storage is basically, uh, unless you manually modify the key, you know, if I'm just reloading the page and I have that value set, so if I log in, now you can see that it's set and I get redirected properly. Um, and if I reload the page, uh, you can see that it's still set. So that's really one of the nice things about HTML5 session storage. It just kind of works like that. Uh, and until I sort of close this and reopen a new tab and open it, uh, and now you can see if I inspect the resources, session storage, it's gone. So it basically is sort of this temporary storage bucket that only exists um, for that session, which is kind of as intended. And if I log out, I've got another copy-paste error. Right, log out, that's success. And because, uh, let's see, am I, yeah, I'm still logged in because that logout didn't actually complete. So now I can hit logout, and now my access control should be working. Yeah, I can't actually get there, uh, and now things are good.
So that's one way you can access session management uh, is by sort of creating this simple little session service that abstracts uh, whatever you want. Uh, and because we made this a service and it's injectable uh, by default with Angular, it'd be pretty easy to modify this so that it worked with cookies or even to add a wrapper and polyfill this stuff so that you know it would use session storage in a browser that supported it and cookies in a browser that didn't. Um, really not a lot of code there to, to get uh, session storage working with HTML5 or sessions working with HTML5 session storage. So that's pretty cool. So we've taken a look at auth. We've taken a look, a very brief look at uh, configuring our app with the run block, uh, injecting the root scope and our authentication service, and sort of figuring out this, uh, this blacklist, basically the routes that require auth. And if you, right now, I only have this one route, this home route, uh, and our login page basically doesn't require auth. And so if you started to build up this list of routes, uh, in your application, uh, then uh, this blacklist might not be uh, appropriate. You could flip it to the to a whitelist uh, and say that uh, here's the routes that don't require auth, which would be slash login, and then you would just invert this uh, to say that it doesn't contain the location path. Uh, so that's as easy it would be as it would be to scale this up so that it would work with uh, more routes. But for now, I just basically checked that. Uh, if it, uh, if it contains that when the location path comes, uh, it doesn't let you in. So I talked about messaging, and if you look in our controller, the auth controller that we built, uh, I returned this response with a JSON array of Flash. And so one thing that I thought would be really nice is to uh, uh, build a tiny little Flash thing and see how easy it would be to do in Angular uh, to add that kind of logic. And it turns out it's really not that hard at all. Uh, so let's look at our single page. The first thing we're going to want to do uh, is add uh, a little bit more markup to sort of display that flash. So let's do that here. We're going to have a row. Uh, we're going to add some of those uh, um, foundation classes. And then we're going to have uh, a flash and more foundation classes so that it shows up nice and bright. Uh, we're going to set ng show to flash. So if you remember from the first video, uh, it's going to look up the uh, the flash uh, in the control in the scope of the controller that this thing is in. And because I haven't defined a controller uh, for this part, it's going to look it up on the root scope, and that should give you a hint about where we're going to add it. And we're just going to show that flash to the user. So if we reload the page, uh, you'll see that there's no behavior. Um, you can see I can inspect this thing and look at flash. And it's set to display num because ng show looks at the scope, root scope, and says, oh, there's nothing called flash. So how do we actually integrate that? Well, again, uh, with most things Angular, we're going to create a service. So let's add a flash service. And it's going to have a couple of simple methods. Uh, One method to show a message, and another to clear the messages. So really simple. Uh, let's stick a message in there, and another function to clear. And so uh, we're going to inject the root scope because that's where we want to stick that message. And this is probably an appropriate place to um, to stick that. And subsequently, clear is going to set it to an empty string. And where are we going to use that flash service? Well, I thought that since our controller, our auth controller, is sending back uh, messages on login and logout, that uh, we should probably do it there. So let's go to authentication service and inject another thing. And you know, as this list of dependencies starts to grow, uh, it's one of the indications that maybe there's an abstraction sort of waiting to come out, maybe some sort of, uh, I don't know, manager object or something that has responsibility for sort of these app-level concerns. But for right now, I'm just going gonna, gonna to let them sit in here. And so our authentication service, uh, one thing we want to show is a login error. So let's create 
a login error function in our authentication service. And it's just going to, um, we've got that key of flash in our responses, and this thing is going to get called uh, when we attach another callback. So let's say login.error, and again, the nice uh, sort of succinct composability of uh, our promise object. So we can say on login.success, I'm going to attach this callback called cache session. If there's an error, I'm going to call um, login.error. So let's see if that works. I don't have any syntax errors. So if I type admin at food or example org and a bad password, there we go. I got my 500 and I've got my flash message that showed up. Uh, so now if I actually log in with the good, um, it sticks around and that's not really desirable. So we can actually attach another success uh, message and we're just going to say flash service dot clear. Uh, which if you remember we just added up here uh, which is just going to nil out that value so let's reload let's log out let's log in with the bad credentials bad and let's log in with the good credentials and there we go the flash message is um, and that's as easy as it is to create a flash service you kind of stick this uh, top level piece of UI, you add an ng show to check the root scope value because this thing is part of the top level app, so it's going to inherit the root scope. Uh, it doesn't have a specific controller. Uh, we create that service, we inject it into our other pieces, and now we've got these nice little composable pieces that we can use to sort of build constructs that you're familiar to in other MVC frameworks. There's a couple other places where we're going to want to uh, add um, some messages, so let's do that. Uh, another place would be, um, right, in our access control layer. So in that run block, uh, we could uh, inject the flash service. And if they actually hit that uh, route, they're probably going to be wondering, well, why the heck didn't I get here? So we can say flash service.show, um, please log in to continue. And that's a little bit nicer than just redirecting them to the login page. So let's see how that would work. I'm logged in right now. I'm going to log out. I'm going to go home. And I get that nice flash, mes flash message of please log in to continue. And because we already set up the clearing uh, when the login attempt is successful, there. So now our flash, me flash message is, uh, is gone. So that's you know basically how you can control authentication, uh, you know, a bunch of cross-level app concerns, showing messages to users, clearing out the messages, adding some logic, uh, and our code really isn't all that long. Like, our authentication service got a little bit longer. It's about, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 lines, but there isn't a whole lot of complexity here, and if you were to write something like this, you know, what we've got to in total in about 126 lines of code uh, in Backbone or in any of the other frameworks, I don't I don't think that you would be able to get sort of that level of functionality with uh, this little code. And I mean, it also speaks to the power of Laravel that we could get up and, and running with this stuff in uh, really not that much code at all. You know, my, my auth controller is pretty simple. Uh, my routes file is also pretty simple. And so, yeah, I mean, pretty cool stuff. There's one sort of uh, advanced thing that we're going to talk about here, and that is uh, what if what if the session expires on the server, and we want our app to be smart uh, about how um, it it handles logging people out, and so we're going to take a look at that, uh, how to handle that, and the way that we can do that is using something called um, HTTP interceptors, and if you think about uh, the HTTP provider or just the idea of the provider in um, Angular you'll realize that uh, it's sort of this global level thing that's going to be basically aware of all concerns related to HTTP. Uh, so if you think, uh, well, what's uh, the thing that could possibly work to you know, uh, indicate to the client app that the server session's expired? Well, a 401, an HTTP 401 unauthorized. If there was maybe an API call that came back from uh, the server that, said, that gave a 401, then that would be an indicator. And the HTTP provider is the place to hook in that concern so that it, it uh, can have the awareness inspecting, kind of like middleware, inspecting the state of any HTTP request. So we're going to call this interceptor logs out user 
on 401. It's going to be a function. And we're going to inject a couple things. Uh, let's stick in the piece that we're going to need. We're going to need that location because we're going to want to redirect uh, if they are indeed logged out. Uh, we're going to use Q, which is Angular's promise uh, library and implementation. Um, we're going to stick in that session service as well that we created and our flash service so that we can show a message to say that our session expired. And so when you're using Q, uh, you want to use a couple pieces. You want to provide uh, a success callback and an error callback. Those are the two primary pieces that you need for a promise. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're actually going to return a function, uh, which takes a promise as an argument. And its only job is to basically say, um, then success and error. And so that's kind of how you compose promises using Q. Uh, so success is going to, success and error are both going to get a response from the server. And we're going to do a couple different things here. Uh, we're just going to return the response if it's successful. So our middleware doesn't do anything invasive on a success. The error is basically where we want to check. And we, we just want to inspect the uh, status property of that response, check if it's a 401, um, and do a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, um, we're going to say q.reject response. We're also going to do that here. But in the case of a 401, that's our indicator. Um, again, this is uh, HTTP not authorized. And we're going to use that as an indication from our API that the, the session has expired. So let's do a couple of things. Let's clear out our session service authenticated key. Uh, let's show a message to the user with our nice flash service. Uh, and we're going to the message we're going to show is actually going to come from uh, the server-side endpoint. So we're going to say flash service.show response.data.flash. Uh, and then let's redirect them. We'll redirect them back to the login. And sort of to simulate this, we can uh, look in our routes. And let's add a new route. Uh, simulates, oh, let's just call it expiry. And we'll just use a closure. And we'll return a response, again, using JSON and an array. Uh, we'll have that flash. Um, your session has expired. Please log in. And a 401 as the code. And that's as easy as it is to compose responses in Laravel. Pretty cool. Uh, so let's take a look here. If we reload, everything's still good. I can log out. Um, let's add a, a query to that uh, expiry um, and see what happens. So let's go back to app and let's change one other thing that I wanted to show, which is um, routes that depend on some data. Uh, you can sometimes in uh, single page apps, you want to render a route like um, the home app or the home template. Uh, I want to render that view, and it might depend on an API call for some data. And the way that Angular handles that uh, is by using this resolve keyword. And basically, that means that it's going to hook into that on route uh, change start event. Um, but before it actually triggers that, it's going to look and see, is there this resolve keyword, and what do I need to resolve? And I'm going to call it expiry. Uh, and this is going to be a function. And we're going to inject HTTP. And I'm just going to return HTTP.get expiry. And so what it will attempt to do uh, is it'll attempt to um, call this function, return the promise, and then assign the value as this expiry key in the controller. So if I go to the home controller, and I just stick this thing in here, expiry, it's going to it inject that dependency. Um, and so now, if we go back here to login, and we log in, you can see that I actually got my 401 unauthorized. Uh, it tried to load the template for home. It, it queried uh, expiry before it loaded that template, um, and it redirected me back. It didn't let me go to home, basically. And so let's make uh, that thing actually valid and see that working. Let's take a look at routes, and let's return some actual JSON 
comment this guy out and reload. Oops, I got a syntax error. Need another brace. And you can see that it fetched expiry before it rendered the template, and you can see that. And if I actually stick a debugger inside of that controller, uh, the home controller, actually just assign it to the scope. Let's say scope.expiry equals expiry data, which is the property that comes back from uh, the HTTP. And then in our template, home.html, uh, let's stick another alert box and add expiry uh, dot flash. And there we go. All is good. And so that's one way that you can uh, add dependencies to your routes so that they will fetch uh, resources first. And you know, you might extract this piece into a service. You might just leave HTTP there uh, and call it right away. Um, but the key point to remember is that uh, whatever you provide as the key in the resolve um, object, that is what the dependency will be mapped into your controller as. So you can see down here, it's expiry. And if I changed it, the key to a capital E X P I R Y, then it would do the same thing. And so now we've got a way through our HTTP interceptor uh, that if we add more routes that are dependent on data and we actually get a 401 back that uh, we will um, unset authenticated, we will show that uh, uh, flash message and um, redirect back to login. Let's see if we've got anything else to cover. I think that's pretty much it. I know that there's a ton of stuff in this video and I moved really fast, but uh, one of the pieces of feedback I got from the first video was people were really happy with the um, the pace that uh, I've, I've even watched a lot of other screencasts and sometimes the length gets a little bit too long. Um, and so I've, I've really worked hard to try and uh, not get bogged down in some of the, the details. Like I didn't show you everything about installing Laravel and configuring all this stuff, and there's you know a bunch of info in the in the README that'll get you up and running with that. So that is my end-to-end uh, -end with Angular JS. Uh, I really hope that you will um, post comments. If you want, follow me on Twitter. It's twitter.com/demoser. Uh, again, I mentioned in the previous video. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Uh, I have no problem answering questions and. Uh, I'm also going to add uh, a bundle of links in this video so that you can go and learn more about Laravel if you want to. You can learn more about um, Angular and just sort of a list of, of really good resources that I used when crafting uh, the materials in this screencast. Uh, so that's all I have to say. And uh, again, thanks for watching.